What do you see in these pictures? In the distant past, our ancestors looked at these things and they saw potential. Potential for transport, for pest control, and potential for lunch. For thousands of years, humans have seen potential in a really wide range of living things, and we've tried to realise that potential by changing them. We use selective breeding to domesticate all kinds of working animals and to improve the productivity of all kinds of crops and farm animals. Now, in recent times, this changed. Most researchers now focus on studying in great detail just a small number of so-called model organisms, such as yeast. This is important because it really helps us understand how biology works more deeply. But it also really limits us, especially now that we can think of biology not only as a science, but also as a powerful technology for engineering living things by reading and writing DNA. We now make precise changes to living things in months or even weeks, not lifetimes. But life on this planet is incredibly diverse, so I think we should be looking at the full range of this diversity as we try to realise the potential of this new synthetic biology. Because traditional model organisms will not be enough. And one of the areas in which model organisms really fall short is chemical manufacture. Today, we rely on oil and gas for the <coughs> chemicals and the materials involved in the manufacture of everything from electronics to medicines to the clothing we wear to the carpet on the floor and the paint on the walls. Actually, living things are really good at making chemicals too. We can hack traditional yeast by adding genes to have it produce chemicals for us. But the problem is yeast and other traditional model microbes have a sweet tooth. They need to be fed a diet like sugar or corn. So this conflicts with the food supply for the growing world population. You can already see for this reason the prices of sugar, ethanol and energy have become linked. But it doesn't have to be that way. Synthetic biology can make use of very different organisms to produce chemicals without oil or food. There are microbes that can grow using the waste part of crops, or methane from landfill, or toxic gases from heavy industry, or even, with the help of light, CO2 right out of the air. Now, what all these exotic microbes have in common is an ability to take a sustainable source of carbon and convert it into basic chemical building blocks inside cells. In my lab at Imperial College London, we work on giving these kinds of microbes the ability to produce chemicals from these sustainable sources, not from food or oil. So we write DNA with instructions for each chemical, and we insert those instructions into cells. But what we're finding is those instructions don't work the same way when we try them in different organisms. It seems there are DNA languages or local dialects that differ from one organism to the next. So we're busy learning those languages in order to get the DNA design right. There's also all kinds of practical challenges. You might think of a scientist as working at a lab bench, which is perfectly fine for traditional model microbes. But what about an organism that is poisoned by oxygen? That's one of the problems we have to solve in my lab, where we often need to recreate the natural habitats of exotic organisms in order to grow them and to engineer them. This is difficult, it's time-consuming, and it's expensive. So it is long-term research, but the opportunities are huge. Waste streams that are expensive liabilities today will become valuable assets as sustainable sources of chemicals. So these opportunities are not only for the environment and food security, but also commercial opportunities. Long-term research also has a habit of producing surprises and innovation from unexpected places. Just imagine if we could hack the organisms that can survive extreme radiation doses like you might find after a nuclear reactor breach, or in outer space. Or the organisms that can grow in boiling water. Or how about the ones that actually breathe metals and produce electricity? In my lab, we even work on engineering a microbe that digests tumours. So clearly, these weird and wonderful exotic organisms are a source of a, a whole range of possibilities. Now, we've come a long way since our ancestors first tried to tame wild horses. But I think we should aim to rediscover that curiosity and that ambition to harness the potential of unfamiliar organisms. In the coming years, we can expect great benefits from synthetic biology in a, a wide range of areas we haven't really even imagined yet. And so I'd like to invite you to think about that amazing diversity of the natural world. And then let's forget what we think biological technologies can do, and instead let's imagine what we want them to do. Thank you.